Yeah, so um, uh, welcome everybody. Thank you for uh, coming. So today in the colloquium, I wanted to talk about uh, something that is sometimes swept under the rug, uh, and that's how to do a lot of computations. Um, so I'm going to talk about what you could call parallel jobs, but that's not really what they are, but that's really what they are. So the motivation for this is that we have a lot of research projects um, that have workloads that really consist of a lot of independent short tasks. Eventually, those collections will have to be uh, uh, taken together, but there's a lot of work that can be done independently. So just as a few examples that I've encountered, um, in genomics, you might have DNA reads that come from a sequencer that you have to align. And there are many of them, and they have to align, be aligned to some reference. And you've got like thousands of them, if not more. Um, and each alignment is fairly short. So that's a short job. You have many of them. Um, you can have uh, parameter studies. Say you're doing uh, molecular dy dynamic simulations or uh, some form of material science or just any simulation, but it's fairly short and you want to sweep all the parameters in the, in, the, in the space to see what happens under different circumstances. Uh, that again, could each of the computations could be fairly short and doable on your own computer. Uh, but if you have thousands or tens of thousands to do, um, it becomes a different beast. Um, medical imaging is another example where you might have, uh, if you do functional uh, MRI, so fMRI is often the abbreviation for that, you might have many, many images because that's a time series of, of, of images and processing each of them, uh, say finding out where different spots are, 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 uh, are et cetera, um, is maybe not essential, uh, that uh, computationally heavy, but you have a whole bunch of them to do and they're all fairly independent. Um, you might have uh, some experimental data. Maybe you're finding gravitational wave signals from LIGO and you want to figure out um, whether they match simulated waveforms and uh, that way detect whether there are gravitational waves. And this is exactly what happened. I do not know if they use new parallel, by the way, uh, but they could have. So in all these cases, you have a large number of jobs, things, think of thousands of jobs, uh, independent, uh, but as the number of jobs grows, you very quickly sort of run out of uh, resources on your own workstation. Um, so what happens next is that uh, is that this is a common reason why researchers move to shared resources like the ones that uh, uh, that we have in Canada. So uh, the old Compute Canada or the Alliance uh, resources is where you would go next. Now they're all independent jobs, so that should be simple, right? Um, and in fact, when you talk to people that are doing parallel programming, parallel processing, they often call this an embarrassingly parallel problem. Um, you just have to run them at the same time. And if you have more as many cores as you have problems, then you get perfect speed up. The number of, uh, of cores is just all the cores do something. So it's embarrassingly parallel in that sense that you would think there's not a lot to think about. Um, that turns out, especially at scale, not really to be true. Yes, the running of them in parallel is trivial in that they don't have to communicate, but um, there's still a lot of subtleties that have to be addressed. So for one thing, you have to make sure that all these jobs are executed correctly, efficiently. You have to keep track of the jobs. Um, what if something goes wrong? Um, do you know which one went wrong? Um, and uh, can you redo them? Can you not redo them? Uh, should you redo them? Is there a failure of the system is a failure of parameters. All these things when you have thousands of jobs is uh, rather uh, cumbersome. Um, in addition, since uh, as a researcher, you would now have been moved to a shared resource uh, such as Rayum or Niagara uh, or, or the other clusters in Canada, you might have uh, to deal with policies that um, you might not like. For instance, there's a maximum number of jobs you can submit to the, to the queue. Uh, there's good reasons for that, but if you have tens of thousands of jobs to do and the limit is a thousand, what do you do? So you have not just the uh, conceptual uh, keeping track of your jobs, but now you have to fit them into whatever uh, policies and implementations are present on the systems that are available to you. Now, since it seems, and I think this is why, 
um, uh, it seems like a fairly simple problem. It's embarrassingly parallel. You just have to shoot off a whole bunch of jobs to different cores, and that's it. Um, and I think because of that, there's been many, many tools that have been created, often just for specific research projects, and people just go, ah, I can script, write a script for this, I will write it. But because it's just a sort of a, a one-off script, um, it gets created, it's used for a while, maybe even maintained for a while, the person graduates and the tool is abandoned. And so what you have is a whole bunch of um, tools that can do the kind of things that I will show in parallel can do, but they're really not maintained. So as long as they work, that's fine. You want something extra or there is a bug, um, you are no longer fine. Right. Um, so, um, and then of course, there, there, you might think, well, it's embarrassing parallel uh, or it's just simple. I can do this myself. Uh, why wouldn't I? Um, I would always strongly argue against writing your own tool if a tool exists. Now, if the only thing that was uh, present or available for dealing with these many independent jobs, then I would say, yeah, okay, you have to write your own script, but that's not really the case. There is a tool that is actively maintained. It's very versatile. It's called GNU Parallel. Um, I like to pronounce it Gene GNU. I don't know why, but I do. Uh, so GNU Parallel, um, and it helps to overcome a lot of the challenges that you might have in doing large scale, embarrassingly parallel stuff. Uh, by the way, um, I realized rereading the title of my my. Uh, seminar here that um, I'm saying parallel jobs orchestration. It's not the jobs the set themselves. So each of these tasks doesn't have to be parallel. Parallel. They they could be, but let's assume that they're not. They can only run on a single uh, serial um, core, um, and we just have many of them. It doesn't really matter if they could be parallel. But of course, if it is a system that could be parallelized um, in other means, maybe that's the way you would speed it up. The whole point here is, of course, that you don't have enough resources. You have to speed it up. You have to use more cores, more, more resources. Um, here, the assumption is going to be that um, this can be not, uh, this cannot be parallelized very well, very efficiently uh, per task. We just have many of them. Okay, so if we have that situation, uh, what are some of these challenges? Why is it not embarrassingly trivial to, to run these things? Uh, why am I giving this talk? Um, for one, if each of these tasks do not take the exact amount of time, uh, the same amount of, of time, um, you will have load balancing issues. So suppose you had, even on your own workstation, uh, four cores, and you try to run four tasks at the same time. Uh, one of them takes uh, a day, the other take two minutes, and you just step away after that and come back in a day, you've wasted three cores. You might not care, and to be honest, if it was one day, why would you care? Your stuff is done, but uh, this does not scale up. So you have to do have to uh, be wary of being able to use all the resources that you have, and the only way to do that is to balance the load uh, of different tasks among different cores. So that's not trivial. Um, another thing that is not trivial is to to generate these tasks. So um, if you have tens of thousands of cases. Um, you don't want to be typing tens of thousands of lines of code for each case separately. First of all, that is very cumbersome, uh, fragile, it's easy to make a mistake. Um, and then if something changes, uh, you have to change all of these lines of code. You really do not want to do that. So ideally, you want to uh, generate these, these tasks, the, uh, each of the tasks that have to be done uh, in, in some sort of way. Again, you could write a script for that, and many people do that, and then just run it, and that is one way to go. Um, but uh, but that still means you are now overcoming that challenge. Another big challenge, I've sort of alluded to that already, is uh, to make things fault tolerant. If you have these tens of thousands of jobs and one of them fails, you should at least know that it failed. So if you just, um, without too much trouble, write a script, you wrote, you generated all your commands, you put them in the script, you submit them to the, the job queue, you wait for a day or so, they're all back and there is an error in one of the 10,000s and it printed out to standard out or standard error and it's in your file, but you have no idea which one was it and what was wrong. That is, that is troubling, especially if you need all of them to be done um, to, to go through the, like the next step. So you need a way to either 
track or find the, the way the things that might have failed. And remember, fail, failure can happen for a lot of different reasons. Um, there could be node failures, they happen from time to time. So you're running on a node, something's wrong. It could be uh, just a typo, right? Um, uh, something that's uh, an expression that you use to generate these tasks that worked for 99% uh, of them, but for that 1%, for some reason, the corner case doesn't work. Uh, again, there are many reasons that you could have failures. So just to assume that there's no failures, especially as the number of jobs get large, is, is, uh, that is embarrassing. And scalability. So you'd want that as the number of jobs increases, um, um, they can be managed efficiently. So um, it has a little bit to do with the load balancing as well, but also means that whatever tool you want, you don't want it to be too uh, too heavy handed. That is to say, for every task that you generate and start, it shouldn't cost a lot of extra time. If your task takes one second and generating the task or launching the task takes a minute, you're basically 60 times uh, uh, inefficient, right? So that's a scalability issue. Related to the full tolerance, there's monitoring and debugging. Even if things are all going well, you might want to know as your jobs are running. Uh, which of them have finished? How far along are you? How fast is it going? Sometimes you do not know how long things will not go, but if you know you're now at like uh, the 5,000th job of 10,000, that's great. If something breaks in the middle, that, it'd be nice to see that right away so you can stop it if you need to. So that's the monitoring and debugging. And then uh, some other challenges, which I have to say are not that well um, dealt with with the tool that I will present, uh, our data management. Um, parallel jobs might be uh, needing the same data. They might try to write to the same file. This is bad. You don't want to do that. They might all create a, a, a separate file. Now you have 10,000 files. That is also bad. Um, data management is an issue at in these situations, and there's ways to deal with it. Um, that's not what I'm going to talk about today. Today is more about the first five uh, points uh, the data management is is a, a separate issue on uh, on the shared clusters that we have um, uh, Cedar, Graham, Beluga, Narval, and Niagara and Mist. The file systems are all shared, so at least when you're launching a job, you don't really have to move data to a compute node, um, but you still have to be worried about how your data is organized. And then finally, another thing that indeed this tool will not do is dependency management. So if you have your 10,000 jobs and some of them depends on other of the jobs to be done, that's a completely different uh, problem. And, and it's no longer embarrassingly parallel either. So we're really going to talk about these, um, these embarrassing parallel uh, situations that are still having all of these challenges. Right. Now, um, one solution to most of these challenges would be to use the scheduler we already have on the system, so Slurm. Uh, Slurm is a job scheduler, and it can, it can launch jobs. Uh, you can ask for specific resources. You can put in dependencies. Um, if you don't have a system where you have shared uh, file systems among the node, there is even ways to have it uh, stage uh, data in and out. So it has all these features. And so in theory, um, this should be a talk about Slurm about how to submit a job, how to submit uh, tens of thousands of jobs, um, and how to uh, uh, keep track of them, and uh, we, we will be done. We have one tool. Um, in practice, however, Slurm is so versatile, let's say, uh, that it takes a while for it to uh, schedule jobs. So just starting a, starting a job into the queue figuring out who in the queue is, uh, is eligible to run, like which job, um, dealing with priorities, which we don't, we're not considering here, but if you have a shared system, Slurm has to consider it. And, and dealing with different constraints is something that takes, takes a while. And so if your jobs are many, like thousands or tens of thousands, um, and they are fairly short and or they are very short, do it, this idea of having a short job of a few seconds and, and having a submission mechanism that takes like a, a minute or maybe longer um, is is uh, is not good. In addition, and this is, this has to do with the uh, so because of the uh, the demands of Slurm, 
there are limits to what you can do in Snurm, how many jobs you can submit, but also jobs that already ran before, like if you ran a lot, your priority goes down. So your next jobs are going to start later. You, you might not care, maybe you shouldn't even care, but because it's fair, you have a certain slice of the system, but it means that all of your, your results will now trickle in slowly and surely, but slowly, and uh, that might not be very practical for you either. Because of that, because of the fact that there are limitations, uh, the fact that it is a little heavy handed for really small jobs, you have to be a little bit worried about uh, some workflow solutions out there that say that they support slur. So they, they might um, advertise to be able to do all of the uh, challenges, address all of the challenges I just mentioned. And they might even be able to do that. But even if they say they support slurm, do they support slurm the way it's implemented on the Canadian shared clusters? And uh, usually the answer is no. Uh, on the general purpose clusters, so those are uh, Graham, Cedar, uh, Narval, and Beluga, um, you have a better chance because they can um, schedule by by core, so you can get you can have a more flexible uh, request. But um, on Niagara, for instance, you have to always get a whole node, uh, which is 40 cores. Um, and if that automated workflow isn't aware of it or doesn't even have a, an option to tell it to do that, it, it will just basically not work. So if you have your own cluster with lots of nodes and you can configure your slurm in the way that works with the workflow, then that's fantastic. And there's nothing wrong with those solutions in that sense. But I've seen a few times that people are trying to use the workflow solution going, ah, it supports Slurm, but then it, does, it, does it do it with constraints? And that's so, so um, that's why we're not using Slurm for some parts of it. But we can't get around not using Slurm at all. And after all, without, um, uh, at least on the clusters, if you don't use the job scheduler, you do not get resources. Um, you can't run on the login nodes, or at least not very long and definitely not many uh, jobs. And so you have to submit jobs. <clears throat> um, so that's okay. Uh, we will still use Slurm for what it is good at. Um, so it's very good at resource management and, and allocating uh, resources. But you have to keep in mind that this has to be happening not on the level of a single task, but on a level of, of a more coarse grained level, say. So uh, you can say, I've, I've got 10,000 tasks. I will let the new parallel deal with them. But then I need uh, one node, two nodes um, with a certain number of cores and a certain amount of memory. And just give me those nodes for a certain amount of time. And then I will have my scripts launch the jobs in there. And we will use new parallel for that laptop uh, task. Uh, right. So it's always going to be a combination of the two. Uh, Slurm and some, uh, let's, be, let's call it a uh, uh, subscheduler, um, uh, in which case we were going to use uh, the parallel. Any questions so far? Okay, no. no. Continue. All right. So let's look at this thing that I've been mentioning like, uh, over and over now. Um, no parallel. What is it? First of all, it's a command line utility. So we're talking about things that work on Unix or Unix like systems, uh, Linux, Mac OS, um, all of the shared systems uh, uh, run on versions of Linux. So that's easy for us. If you have a Mac, you can make this work. There's always some tweaks with a Mac, but you can make this work. If you have a Linux machine, great. If you have Windows, uh, get the Windows subsystem for Linux, and then you have Linux, and you can still use it. So it's a very versatile tool for workflows that involve uh, independent parallel uh, tasks. So you can do parallel processing um, on uh, several processors and even on different uh, computers, uh, nodes in our case. I'm not going to show you how to do that because it's not always the best way to go, uh, but it, you can make it work such that it basically you get a couple of nodes and you have new parallel SSH in the nodes when there's uh, jobs for them to do. It does a dynamic load balancing. So you can basically say, I, I want these thousands of commands to be ran, run um, and just run them such that all the cores are busy as long as there's stuff to do. Um, 
And so what it will do is whenever a core is done with its command, it will just give it a new command. It is like a scheduler, but a very similar, it's a very simple scheduler in that sense. Um, it does offer a lot of uh, things for control. So you can do job queues, you can do error handling, you can do progress mod monitoring. Uh, and so it's ideal for these cases that I mentioned where you have a lot of very similar cases to do uh, and they can be done in parallel. Um, if you're going to use this tool, um, you should you should always cite who you, uh, what you use. And so this is the, the first line is the official reference uh, for the GNU Parallel tool. So if you use it in your research and you write a paper, you should put this reference in there. Um, and um, if you and there's a nice tutorial that that shows way more possibilities than I can do in this this short seminar. Um, and the link here is to I will put the the PDF on uh, on the Signet course website uh, afterwards. Um, if you can't find it, just send an email and I'll I'll show you to it. And you have those links too. Okay, so let's look at an example. And I'm starting from um, what is sort of my uh, computational home, which is Niagara, because I'm from Sinet and we host Niagara and it's a, a large parallel machine. And different from what might you might expect, we do not just run large parallel jobs on Niagara. Those are what Niagara is designed for, but if we only ran those, like no things that, that run in parallel with like uh, a thousand tasks or more, um, you'd have a lot of nodes, a lot of cores not doing anything for a while while um, um, you know, other jobs are finishing. So we also <clears throat> support some form of serial processing, but we still schedule by node. So every node is 40 cores. You have to have at least 40 cores. And so you can run these small jobs, as long as you make sure that once you get that 40 core node, you run it. How do you do that? You use GNU Parallel. So here's an example of how you would do that. So it's a job script on the right. And so it starts like that, um, asking for one node, um, one task. On Niagara, you could also ask for 40 tasks and one CPU per task. Uh, you can also ask for one task and 40 CPUs per node. Because it's per node, it doesn't matter, um, but it, it, it Think of this job script as the task, and then the CPUs are going to do the subtask or subjob, uh, which actually kind of brings me to a, a, a distinction that I have to make whenever I'm talking about new parallel on a uh, on a cluster. <clears throat> jobs are what Slurm schedules, but jobs are also what new parallel uses for each of its commands uh, that it runs. So I'm going to call those subjobs. No parallel doesn't, it calls them jobs. I will call them subjobs. Um, so we, we've got this node for an hour. Uh, it has 40 cores that gives you the whole node. Um, and then on Niagara, you have to load a module, uh, a new parallel to get the parallel command. The command itself is just called parallel, um, but the, the module is new parallel. And on the, on the other clusters, you do not have to load the module for it. Um, the jobs that it will run are given in a long list here. So each line in this list is supposed to be one command. So the first command is to run my code one and then type something to screen uh, called job one done. So my code is supposed to be a program that I have to run with a thousand different command line arguments. So from one to a thousand, the dot dot dots are not real. They're supposed to be a thousand lines. Um, so I have a thousand lines here and I'm giving them to parallel. And I'm telling Parallel to try and run these commands, so these thousand commands, and each line is a command or a sub job, um, on 40 cores. You know, really what I'm saying is start 40 of them at the same time and make sure that you keep 40 running at any given time until you run out of jobs and there's no more jobs in the class. Um, so that's the dash J40 flag. And it should coincide with how many CPUs I asked for. So that's why 40 and 40 are the same here. <clears throat> but it could be that you'll have uh, that the program my code actually needs a lot of memory. Um, on uh, the Niagara nodes, you have a, about 188 gigabytes, so a little bit more than four gigabytes per core. If it needed more, um, if I start running 40 of them at the same time and then eight, eight gigabytes per core, I would run out of memory, the thing would crash, and that's not good. So then you could have a case where the number of CPUs is still 40, but the number of parallel tasks that parallel launches would be less. Um, so here's, this is 
what I meant with uh, you have a combination of slurm. The slurm will make sure I get slurm will make sure I get a node with with the with, uh, with the as many CPUs as I need. Um, and um, parallel, the parallel will take care of running these jobs. So what it will do is it will start with the first 40 sub jobs. Um, so the first 40 in the line and run them on different cores. And in fact, it just uses the operating system for that. The, the operating system has 40 cores for you um, because we asked it on Slurm, so you get 40 cores. Whenever you start a new job in the background, the operating system actually puts it on a core that's not busy. That's the job of the operating system in this case. Um, but it basically launches 40 at the same time. Um, and then as soon as it finds that one of them has finished, so it tracks them, it finds out that say job number 10 is already finished, the other ones are still going, it will give uh, core 10 a new job. So that would be job number 41. And so anytime a job is done, a new job is started on that core or it is launched um, until you have no more sub jobs in the list. Now, I, I say that, but it's not entirely what's happening because I added a, uh, a dash just shop option. And there's, there's a reason for that. Um, if we look at these different commands, one, two, a thousand, it is quite possible uh, for instance, that the larger numbers take long, take longer, right? But that would mean that, um, or maybe the first one take longer. Say the first one takes longer. Um, that I could, that I have a load imbalance that I cannot control. So to optimize the load imbalance, I can shuffle the jobs. I don't have to. It depends on on your load. But that means that rather than starting the first forty, it just starts forty random ones from the list. And then when one is done, it picks one that hasn't been run yet. So that, that's an, an extra shuffling I, I did here. Um, but so you have two, uh, two mechanisms here that help in balancing the load. So assume for a moment that these different my code runs run in very different uh, times. So maybe some are a few seconds, some are a few minutes. Um, then um, the shuffling makes sure that I, I Run them at random times, so that should help uh, not getting bogged down in a, in, in a few that are really heavy. Um, but the, and then the fact that as soon as one of them, one of the sub jobs is done, a new sub job is started, um, means that I, I don't underutilize any of the cores. Um, by the way, this example is just the beginning. You can run like this. It's not the most Powerful way to use new parallel, um, but it, it will work. Okay, so I um, want to mention that because uh, you can run multiple nodes, you can have records of what is uh, 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 run so far, information on the sub jobs, how long they took, their exit status, etc. And we'll see some of that a little bit later on. Um, for completion, here's the same. Uh, oh, um, there's a question. Go ahead, you can I'm, speak. I'm just wondering what happens if you estimate the memory wrong and you ask for 40, but that would actually use up too much memory. Does the whole thing just collapse or? Yeah, yeah uh, not necessarily. So there's, uh, you can give, so by default, if something fails, one of the jobs fails because it's run out of memory, it fails and parallel goes on with the next jobs, uh, which might be exactly what you want. And then later you can check which one failed. But you can also give an option to stop as soon as there's an error. And, and so it really depends. So you can choose. Um, I don't remember the option name exactly, but so it, that's that's okay. But if you if you if you let that job fail and you continue with the rest, there's no way that that failed job would be automatically rescheduled later by by uh, not, not automatically, but there is a way to after that job has done to resubmit it and have it only run the ones that failed. So then you could take the same list and you could resubmit your job um, and it knows what has been done, but you said in this case, you give it uh, a, a less than, uh, no, in this case, there was 32, uh, less than, 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 than the 40 uh, jobs at the same time. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Right, so just for completion, this is how it would run in Graham. It's pretty much the same. 
On Graham, the, the, the full node ones would have 32 tasks. Um, you don't have to run on a full node, but if you have lots of tasks, it's probably the easiest way. Um, and we're asking for all the memory um, because once we have our 32 cores, why wouldn't we? In, on the Agra, you don't have to ask for memory. You always get the whole memory. So that's why that wasn't there. Um, you do not need new parallel as a module. Um, I'm only loading GCC here as an example. You should load whatever modules are needed for this for this command. So that's just just an example. Um, yeah. So that's how it would run there. Um, and again, if uh, if you need me less memory for every one of these jobs, um, you could you could mess around with the dash J uh, flag. Um, if you need the memory for for uh, for the tasks anyway, uh, you want to stick to a whole node probably. Um, if you're not running, right, you don't have to run this on a supercomputer. You can run it on your own computer. You just basically get rid of all the SFetch uh, jobs. And so you can just run it with the parallel command. Um, you'd have to install GNU Parallel. Uh, in Linux, Linux, most of the uh, distributions, you can just uh, do the install command that's appropriate for it, apt, dnf, yum, um, and it will install Parallel. You can also download the latest version uh, from this, this link here. Um, if you're on Mac, I think it's in in, uh, in Macboard and in Brew. Um, I don't have a Mac, so I haven't tested any of these things, but in principle, that should work fine. Um, and one of the, uh, the convenient things that you can do on your own computer is you can say, just use all the cores that I have. So I don't have to do a dash J argument there. It will just use whatever cores there are. This should work also in job scripts, but I tend to not want to rely on that because um, this now really depends on how the schedule is set up. And maybe if it does work, uh, you go to this is a different system, it doesn't work. So um, only on your own system, I would, I would suggest not saying that's J something. Um, the other stuff is all the same. And so you can just play around this with this on your own, uh, on, on your own machine. Obviously, you'll have less parallelism, but at least you can uh, uh, debug and make sure your, your workflow works before you actually do the whole, uh, the whole case. Uh, just to give you an idea of what this load balancing does in a picture. So imagine on the left, we have a case where we don't do any load balancing. Uh, time uh, runs from top to, uh, to bottom and uh, the cores are from, uh, from left to right. So that, imagine that this was a, an eight core machine, eight core uh, computer um, and uh, core zero was given a task that runs only for let's call this one unit. Uh, core, the second core was giving uh, this task that has to run for three. Uh, units um, and then etc. So each of the cores is busy for a little while. If I do them in pure batches and I just and I do not know their duration ahead of time, um, I would start these eight and just wait until they're done, and then do another eight and wait until they're done, and do another eight and wait until they're done, and do another eight and wait until they're done. If I did that, that is the the absence of load balancing, right? Um, if instead I do what GNU Parallel does, and as soon as one of these uh, course is done, I start a new job and it will get that job to do. Everything sort of um, fits better. And there's only white space at the bottom here because there's no more tasks to do. So there's still some, you could call it underutilization, but there's not much you can do about that. You do not know that this task was going to be any longer. Um, so you didn't know that you should have scheduled it a little bit sooner. Um, so it's always going to be when, when you don't know how long things are going to take, there's always going to be some hit in utilization, but uh, going down from 17 hours to 10 hours for even just these eight core uh, uh, example is, is what you gain. Yeah, so load balancing, that's done. Knu Parallel can do that for you uh, and that's great. So that's, but one of the things that is a little bit annoying is that we have this long list of tasks um, that we have to specify. And so one of the ways to, to uh, get around that, a step to, to a better way of doing that is to put them in a file. So you can put these in a file. I've called the file subjobs here. The same lines are here. And then instead of, um, instead of having it in the job scripts, I can pipe that file into, so it's it less for them, uh, fine. I can pipe it into the new parallel command. It does the same thing, but what's nice is now I can sort of separately uh, maintain the list of commands and the job, uh, the job scripts. 
Um, one thing, and we've had this before in the slides, but this is uh, maybe easier to explain here. I have this command, no run if empty. If any of these lines were empty by accident, I just put it in an editor and I hit enter once, um, no parallel would see that as a job. The job name is empty string. Empty string is not a valid job name. It's not a valid command. And so it would fail. It would register it as failed. The other ones would still be done, but you'd get this odd thing where it would say that your Slurm job has failed. Because if one of the commands fails, the, the, the compiler will say, well, there was a failure. So I'm going to report that. Um, by saying no run on empty, any empty line is just skipped, which is kind of what you probably expect. And so that's why I also have. Still, these file-based approaches are a little annoying because I still have to write a thousand lines. So maintaining that list is annoying and there should be a better way. And there is a better way. One way would be to generate that file, to write another script and it generates the file and that can work. Uh, but there's a, a, a lot of very nice features in the barrel that can help you with that, where that's not necessary. So this, uh, the calls this replacement strings. Um, they're kind of like templates that you give for your commands. And then from the template, you generate all of the commands that you have. So the simplest case is, um, is given like this. So imagine I do the parallel commands. I'm going to run things in parallel. What command am I going to run? I'm going to run the echo command so that it prints something. What should be printed? Uh, three cases, A, B, and C. So, so the, uh, the, the commands uh, starts here and is stopped by these triplets, triplets, colons, and whatever is after the triplet colon um, is the, uh, are the different cases, but they become arguments to the command. So what it really becomes is echo A, echo B, echo C as a list of commands that have to be run in parallel. Um, so the output then is A, B, and C. These are run in parallel and you don't really see it. Um, they could, because they're run in parallel, actually the order of the output could be, could be different. Um, but that's a, uh, you know, that's how that goes. Now, um, so you have a command and then something gets pasted at the end. If it shouldn't happen at the end, so if the substitution of your, uh, your input list shouldn't happen at the end, you can use this uh, uh, empty curly braces in the command. So it works kind of like this. Um, so your command could be echo curly braces uh, is a letter. Um, that's the command. And then my input list is A, B, C. And so what that generates is A is a letter B, C is a letter C is a letter. So this is a substitution, a replacement string of any of the input, uh, input uh, words. Okay, so um, if we use that syntax, the way to write our, uh, our code would be to, uh, to have the parallel command and the command that we want for each of the lines. So that was my code and then it was a number. So the number will be taken from the input line and then it says echo job done. Um, and so that has to be on here too. And then our list of numbers. So it's a little bit better in the sense that we don't have to repeat the command. So there's this less chance of mistakes. Um, we have to quote this command. So there's, there's a bunch of quotes going on. One quote is just because of the echo command. Uh, which in this case aren't really necessary, but they were there anyway. Um, and then there are single quotes um, for the whole command. And that is just because um, if I put this on a command line, um, the command line, so, so bash or set shell, whatever you're running as your shell, um, will look at special characters like the semicolon and say, oh, that's the end of your command. So we have to protect this command from the shell. And so that's, what, that's uh, quoting it's the easiest way to get that done. Um, by the way, if, you're, if you want to do a command with uh, input, output, redirection, quoting is again the answer to, to how you would do that. Um, also note that if I have any options, like the shuffle option, I can't put it at the end um, because then it would be one of my input parameters. So it has to go to the beginning. Um, and so that's, that's what we'll do. Now, this is still a very long line, line to type and to maintain and actually might be even worse in an editor because this is just one very long line. Um, so we don't really like that. Um, so we're going to use a utility that, since this is a Linux utility or a Unix utility, uh, we can use other Unix utilities. And the sec command is particularly useful in this case, because it's just a command that prints a sequence of numbers. And that's 
most easily explained by this example. The command sec4 would print the numbers one to four. Sec2, four would print the numbers two up to four. Sec2, one half, four would print the numbers two to four, but with step size of a half. So you get two, 2.5, 3.0, 2.5, uh, and four. And, and so it, it formats them. So there's ways to say how to format it, but it formats them in a way that is at least consistent among the different ones. So that's nice. Um, and then if we want to use this output, so this prints it to screen, we can use the, the, uh, the notation in, in, in bash and things like Chelsea say, um, the dollar sign and uh, parentheses, which captures the output of this command and then puts it on the command line. Um, and so here we're taking these numbers, uh, we're putting them behind the echo, and so echo is printing those same numbers. So this will make it uh, easy to, to generate a, a list of a thousand numbers. And so now um, the GNU Perl command or uh, uh, JavaScript, and it's the same in the top, nothing has changed, but it's now a parallel command. I want to run perf things in, in parallel. I want to shuffle them. Uh, this is my command. Here's my replacement, and the, uh, the arguments are just a sequence of a thousand numbers. I see a couple of questions, so I'm gonna look at that. Um, Mark had an option. Uh, had a, yeah, there, that could, the, the memory could be helpful, but it depends a little bit. So, um, but thanks. Um, Question. So in the national HPC environment where we are competing with many users, it seems that submitting array jobs with, with modest computational resources would be preferable. Um, yeah, so array jobs can be useful if it's just a few. Um, and so sometimes it, it might be useful to combine the two techniques, but in general, if you have a dozen or so things to do, array jobs are usually fine. If you have thousands, I would go to parallel. Um, then there's a question, how can we use threads for parallelization in an application that supports it? So that's a good question. Um, if it's well, if it's um, well parallelized, so if the threads are used efficiently, efficiently, you can just use less, uh, less jobs with the same number of CPUs, so say 20, and then set whatever variable sets the number of threads in your application. So if it's an OpenMP application, you would export OMP non threads equals two, uh, make J equals to 20. So the total is still 40. And that, that would be a way to do parallelized, uh, open MP parallelized ones. Oftentimes though, depending on, uh, on how it's written, it might just be um, most effective to not use the parallelization in the separate jobs. Um, depends on the scale. Um, I'm gonna skip this one, but there's a way to list your files and use them as input file uh, inputs. Um, so that could be useful. Um, one thing that I do want to mention, because we're running a little bit out of time, um, is that you don't have to have just one input. You can have several input lists. And that's really, uh, really cute. Um, so you can have a command that has an input list of one, two, and a second input list of A, B. So you just get a new set of triple columns and let's say a third list of exclamation and question mark. And if you run that, it runs every combination of them. So if you're doing parameter sweeps in several dimensions, um, rather than having to write out every dimension or generate it somehow, um, this is a really, uh, really neat trick. Um, if you don't want them in this order, so your uh, or you need to reuse them, say, uh, the different input parameters have names that aren't just not, they're not just empty curly braces, but with a number. So the curly brace with one inside, is from the first list to two, is from the second list and the third list. And the third. So then you just get uh, the same, but with the third argument in front, because that's how it's happening. There's a bunch of other substitution strings that you can use um, that I, 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 I can be useful depending on how you do it. Um, the example that I glossed over about files is, is, uh, is kind of where these uh, come in handy. You can take a file and strip its extension. Uh, you can take a, a file and only have its base name, so not the directory part, uh, or just the directory part. 
or the base name without the extension. Uh, those are nice if you're dealing with files. Um, other ones that can be useful sometimes, and this can be tricky, but um, you might want each job. So each job gets what's called a, a sequence number. Um, so even if, um, if you're running a shuffle, the first job that's launched will get sequence number one. The second job that's launched is, is sequence number two. So every job is, is distinguished by when it was started. Um, some are started at the same time, but they still are, are sequentially numbered. So that's the sequence number. And you could use that, for instance, if each of them has to write to a different file or a different directory, uh, you could use this substitution string to just uh, make sure that they go somewhere else. Um, and then um, the percent substitution street string gives you your, your job slot number. So that's a bit abstract perhaps, but if you were running on 40 cores, um, you can conceptually think of it as each job is running on a core, that percent is the number of the core. So it's core one, two, three, four, or whatever. It doesn't really happen that way because the operating system is allowed to uh, shuffle things around, but conceptually that's what it is. So uh, Numperial calls them slots, that's why it's not calling them cores. And so, um, but what that means is that um, whenever there's a number of jobs running, each of them has a unique slot number. And so one thing that you could use this for, and it has been used for that, is suppose you have a, uh, a multi-GPU node and you want to run in parallel, but each of the uh, applications should use a different GPU. If you run four at the same time, uh, you could tell with this percent sign if it's one, two, three, or four, and you could use that to distinguish uh, which GPU to use. It's not terribly trivial, and I don't have an example right away, but that's the kind of thing you could you could uh, you could do with that uh, slot number. Okay, so we can do task generation. That challenge is done. Um, the rest is going to be just me talking quickly about some other things, but we're not we're not too far behind. We started a little late, unfortunately. Uh, so um, no parallel can keep track of your jobs. And so that's the next topic. Uh, right now, everything just goes to screen. Um, if there's a failure, you still kind of have to figure out which one failed and how. Um, there's a solution for that with no parallel. Uh, one way to do it is to put everything in a database. And it doesn't have to be a fancy database. It could be SQLite. It could also be a fancy database. Um, so like MySQL or Postgres, I think, are supported. Um, but in this case, um, you can have a database, it's just a file, and the file here is called dp.sq, and um, to, to have Nuparel use that database for its jobs and to update them when they are done, uh, to put in exit codes and durations of each of them, um, it first has to create the table for it. So you do that with the uh, dash -s SQL master, which really should be renamed, but whatever. Uh, Parallel dash -s SQL master, you give it a file name, uh, you tell it that it's an SQLite tree because Parallel knows uh, different databases. And then uh, then come the same commands that you would run, but it's not running them. It's just sort of preparing a table of them. And then once the table is prepared, you can run them with Parallel dash SQL worker. And so this is one of those cases where something, if something fails, you could run it again and it can try it again. I think there's an extra option that you give, but um, that's how that would work. So in that table, you now get uh, per job, um, whether it's completed, um, how long it took, uh, what parameters were used for it. So you get the exact command that was run in it um, and, uh, and also the exit code. So if it fails, the exit code will be zero. If not, there will be something else. Um, so all the information is, is in the database. Um, you don't have to use a database. You can also use a log file. Um, so the dash -dash job uh, log log file option will cause the, uh, the records to write to basically a text file. But it's, it's structured in a way that it can still be used as a restart uh, script. So it contains enough information about all the jobs that um, you could run it again uh, with dash dash resume and it will, uh, it will run all the things that haven't run yet. And then, um, so that, that, that's sort of the, uh, um, the tracking part. So the job log by itself, I almost always use that. Um, I don't always want a database, but then at least in the file, I can see exactly what happened and what hasn't happened. Um, and then if there's something that hasn't happened, I could, I could resume it. So in the case of running out of memory, I could resume it, but with a, uh, with, with a larger memory requirement, for instance, I could try that. So we can do monitoring. That's our job log file or our database. And we have some sort of fault tolerance in the sense that it, it's not automated. You could automate it, but probably you want to take a, a look at what went wrong first. Um, 
but it is fault tolerance in the sense that uh, once we decided that the errors can be uh, uh, retrieved by redoing, um, we can resume and we don't have to resume the whole thing, redo the whole thing. All right, so on the hour, that's fantastic conclusion. Um, first of all, when you're running your jobs, you should know what kind of application you have. If it is threaded and it can do, and you don't have the thousands of them and it parallelizes nicely, or if it's an MPI process, fine, use it, right? But if it doesn't, um, there's ways to run it in serial, as I showed. Um, be sure to use all of the uh, jobs. So don't run them in batches if they don't take the same amount of time. Um, that's a bad idea. Use GNU Parallel for your jobs um, instead. And that's, that's all I have. Thank you.